Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to Marvelous Movie Mondays. Kelsey, thank you so much for bearing through a head cold to be here and talk about uh, a whole series plus a premiere of another one. Like, this is crazy. We're doing a whole series recap, um, even though the series is 15 minutes long. And if you take away commercials or, sorry, uh, credits, it's probably, uh, well, I think it is 15 minutes long, but like 25 with with credit. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying, but it's a very yeah. short series. But but we're, we're talking about I Am Groot today, all five episodes. Uh, she's got the shirt. I know. Did you plan that? Mm-hmm. Of course, of course did. I did. I, I, I was going to be so amazed if you didn't. Um, I was going to be like, oh my God, what a coincidence. And I was like, no, there's no coincidences. Um, no. And then, of course, episode one of She-Hulk, because that's the big thing right now. There's a lot of topic of conversation about Steve Rogers, which we'll get to. Um, and just a lot of thoughts on the series in general. We are not critics who get advanced screenings to Marvel movies. So we only saw the first episode, not the first four. So you're seeing all these reviews on the internet of the first four episodes. Unfortunately, we only got one. Uh, but because you only got one audience, we're going to be talking about just that one. And it's going to be great. So we, we're going to be talking about it, not knowing what's coming next, which will be fun. Um, Kelsey, how are you doing? First of all, I, I mentioned you did have a little bit of a cold, but thank you for bearing it, uh, bearing with us and, and uh, toughen it out. Yeah, of course, still. Hey, nothing serious going on here. Just the minor head cold, okay? Yeah. I know everyone yeah. freaks out nowadays and people get sick, but I promise you it's just the sniffles. I'm mm. going to live. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. I thought my problems were bad, but it's just because I had one too many beers last night, but that's okay. Mm. Um, I will be okay. <laughs> uh, I was just tired today. I was like, I need an extra half hour, Kels, before we record. <laughs> just because I needed that yeah. half hour to just stand in the shower and kind of do the thing where you like hold your hand in the shower yep, and just kind of yep. like start, uh, nod your head and kind of you ever do a good sleep shower, standing up like, sit, like a horse you just i've never down, sat no and you let the water I, just i don't have a chair and I, I don't like the idea of sitting right on the ground i don't know oh, i sit um, right on the ground <laughs> okay <laughs> when i'm hungover ooh, a shower sit you're okay. really sad shower sit <laughs> okay. all right yeah I, i've got to try that yeah no I, I, i'm more of a like a lean against the wall and kind of fall asleep like a horse standing up um <laughs> gotcha. do we have any do we have any news or do we want to kind of just jump right into uh i am Groot? i don't have any news all right do let's you? just jump into i am Groot. no i mean the news is she hulk this week i mean usually when a marvel series drops the first episode there's not really a lot else going on but uh but before we get to she hulk let's talk about i am Groot. five episodes yeah totally um let's just start at the beginning i mean i mean we could talk about what the premise is for anyone who hasn't seen them it is a series of five little shorts um they're not connected in any way except for the fact that they are all about Groot um and there's very minimal dialogue two episodes have other dialogue that is not just Groot but uh, it is mostly just Groot saying I am Groot Vin Diesel stars in all five uh we may or may not see and they have another guardian and another um and then um yeah that's that's about it i mean the premise is just like kind of Groot's daily life and what it's like when he's not being a superhero which yeah. i think is actually a really cute premise like i i think it's a sweet premise i wish these were not longer because i think they're exactly as long as they need to be but i wish there mm -hmm. were just more of them um yeah because they are really cute and you know what they should do and and this is something that people nowadays might not know but well or kids nowadays might not know but in the olden days like I'm talking like it's not just like 20 years ago but they used to show Pixar shorts before Pixar movies so you would go to see a Pixar movie and there would be a short film beforehand um usually only 10 minutes or less like there's one of these birds on a you know electrical pole uh thing there was one of like these little snow globe oh, characters yeah. interacting there was the yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. volcano who sang like there's a lot of great little shorts um and they stopped doing that um ever since the pandemic they just stopped they they um they didn't do one for Toy Story 4. I guess that was pre-pandemic. They didn't do one for Toy Story 4. They didn't do one for, um, uh, what's the newest one? Lightyear. Uh, so we we don't really see the Pixar shorts anymore. And then, of course, a few of them went to Disney+. Plus. Um, but I think this would be a cool idea to, like, put one of these before every Marvel film. Like a little short film. Like, a, you know, a way to in just get you back in the universe without having to jump right in. Like, because some of the Marvel movies, they jump right into the drama. Like, we've we got Thor Love and Thunder jumps right into the gore stuff. And then, like, right. uh, Avengers Endgame, it opens with Hawkeye. So, like, imagine if you just had that little levity beforehand. I, I think that'd be pretty nice. But, um, alas, what did you think of the series as, like, a whole before we jump into, like, kind of the individual episodes? But, like, what would you Sure. Think? Well, obviously, Dale, being that Groot is my favorite character in the MCU. Yes. Even I though had... you let him lose the bracket. Whatever. Never mind. Oh, my God. 
You're never gonna way, let way me live that Way back when, we did, for anyone listening, we did a bracket a while ago of all the Avengers, and I was pushing to put Groot forward, and Kelsey's the one who decided not to. Um, but I was trying was, to I be objective and not subjective, because what was and the was, bracket like? Picking the best. It was just Avenger? the best Marvel Avenger, yeah. And yeah, and I think objectively, Groot isn't the best. He's still my favorite, but that doesn't mean he's the best. Listen, right. Wanda won that bracket, I'm pretty sure, and I yeah. stand by that to this day. I, I stand by it, but I do think even after Phase Four, if we were to redo it, I, I think some of it would change for sure. But oh, um, probably also with the addition of new characters too, because we got all those Eternals, we got Shang Chi, we got Yelena, Kate Bishop, all that stuff. So right. Um. But yeah. Well, what do you think of the series? Uh, being such a Groot fan. I thought that it was so cute, you know, yeah, it was, was it's, it's so funny. Groot is such a complex character, especially baby Groot, because now that we have him as a teenager, like he's very much in his don't bother me, dad, I'm mm-hmm. playing my video games phase where he's kind of really not involved in like, yeah. he doesn't really care about being a superhero or an Avenger. He's just kind of there because like his dad told him he had to be there. But like baby Groot is like, yeah, I'm big and tough, but I'm also a baby. So please don't hurt my feelings. And it's just like, yeah. it's so fun to literally watch this like CGI baby tree character go voiced through by this Vin like, Diesel. <laughs> voiced by Vin Diesel go through like such wide range of emotions in literally only three minutes <laughs> yeah. so that was, it, it's great yeah and it's great because yeah like you said it's like that innocence of being a child but also like the added bonus of being this tree monster who can fuck shit up um yeah. and, and we see that a lot we, you know, we we see a lot of fucking of shit up um but let's start at the beginning uh these episodes i talked last week i was like let's see where they fit in the timeline it's pretty simple the, f- the first episode takes place like right after um guardians one when he's in the pot literally mm-hmm. uh, right right from that moment and then the other four i believe take place either before guardians two or like somewhere in the middle of guardians two but like in that realm i mean they all kind of take place within one another but Gar- the first one is groot's first steps i, I don't know if kelsey you wrote synopsises for these or you just i did not it. yeah I so groot's first steps, uh basically yeah it's it's him first learning how to walk after being in the pot he's battling this uh what, what is it, a bonsai tree? Uh, he's battling yeah. this bonsai tree <laughs> that <laughs> yep, has yep, no yep. life to him. I mean, obviously, trees have life, but no, like, characteristics like Groot does, like, no personality, no actual, like, face or voice or anything like that. But he battles this bonsai tree, falls out, breaks the plant, the pot, and ends up learning how to walk and, and walks. I mean, it's very, very straightforward. Um, yeah. This is my least favorite of the five, only because I think it is the most, like, simple and straightforward and really the sure. least happened. Um, but what do you think of this one? Uh, I thought it was, you know, this was the one where I like laughed out loud. I okay. remember because I wrote down funny. <laughs> that's that's what I wrote. Down. Okay, yeah, I mean, all of them are cute and, and funny, yeah. but um, yeah, like this one was pretty straightforward. Um, should we move on to the next one? I mean, that's like yeah. our reviews. Okay, great. Um, they're three minutes long, so we're not going to talk more than a minute on all these. But like the little guy is the next one where a uh, group basically finds under this rock this like whole like herd of like little. Uh, creatures i don't know what they are like little bugs because he's pissed off because a bird or or some creature ruins his house but then he realizes that there's critters even smaller than him even though he's so small and he decides to like you know uh find um what what is it he finds a bush to try to get them food but then he accidentally steps on them at the end and and kills them but then we find out they're alive anyway and they pop up um and honestly i kind of like the boldness of that idea at the end of that after all this this whole three minutes he just crushes them with his feet i'm like that is so funny but then they popped up and i'm like ah okay so we're we're still doing this for kids and we can't have them die but i I thought it would have been funnier if that was just the end of it but um yeah what do you think of this one Excuse me. Sorry. So, yeah. Okay. Well, the first thing I noticed at the beginning of this one was that the Milano was in the background. Yeah. That. And then I wrote down, Dill, that's, that was sad. And then immediately after I wrote that down, they showed like, because they they played the credits and then they played like kind of like a post credit, a a (laughs) lemon credit. We're getting a post credit scene in in a three minute short. That's Yeah. And then I said, oh, never mind. They're alive. (laughs) Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. It was a cool choice that kind of 
backtrack, but it's whatever. The next one, Groot's Pursuit. And this was my favorite for a while. This was the one where um, Baby Groot basically meets a uh, like bubble liquid imitating version of him. Yeah, it's like yeah, thing. yeah. It like, imitates other things. And we actually heard it speak, which was very interesting, in a voice that was not Groot's. Uh, I don't know if it was Vin Diesel's or not. I didn't actually look. But it was very interesting to see that, like, uh, the... Um, the the Groot but talking it just felt wrong but but then we get this really great dance off where they basically fight and dance off and then they go for the same type of ending where he just kind of opens the hatch and the bubble guy just like dies he just fly, floats away he's like yep see ya and then he just keeps dancing and that to me is like kind of what the last one I thought it was gonna be and then it kind of backtracked like this one that actually stuck the landing in terms of like committing to that kind of dark morbid ending of just like okay bye um even though it was just a bubble uh, being ejected, but the bubble, yeah, Iwua, I- 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 I don't know the, how you pronounce it, but yes, a uh, comic character, I, I assume. Um, Kels, what do you think of this one? So, the first thing I noticed about this one, Dill, is that he kind of had like an Apple Watch thing going that he uses as like a kind of mm-hmm. like a miner's like yes. uh, helmet with a flashlight mm-hmm. on it. And um, so, I'm looking at the I am. DB right now and Ben Diesel voice baby Groot. James Gunn is actually Voices the voice the of the yeah. rich of the wristwatch. And Trevor Duvall voices I I Wua. Okay, cool. So it's Trevor Duvall. That. Um very interesting. Um, so yeah, we get a few more vo- vocal appointment appearances here, which was which was nice. But I just love the dance off. Like that was just so fun. Yes. It, was just, it, it just captured the spirit of Guardians for sure. Absolutely a dance off, bro. And I noticed that uh Groot was in christmas pajamas i didn't know if it had anything to do with christmas or that's yeah. just like what they had available that fit group and we have um, a christmas special coming later this year with the guardians so maybe um that's gonna tie into that maybe maybe iowa is a bigger maybe. part of that who knows and i did notice that while Groot is going to the bathroom while he's using the toilet he's reading a book and these are the only th- there's four things on the book but I could only really see three of them really clearly. And it was clearly a picture of Thanos, a mm. small little creature, the same, it looked like the same shape and, and species of creature that attacks his house in the little guy episode. Yeah. Okay. Um, that like little puff ball thing with the mm-hmm. long nose and a purple banana. And I'm just saying, wondering, we'll see, we'll see the purple banana later, but I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah. I'm wondering what what is that what could that book be know. about i don't know <laughs> <laughs> thanos with a banana and a bird i have no idea um so you you were talking about him going to the toilet now we're gonna go to Groot takes a bath and this is a, yes. another fun one kind of like a chia pet episode where he's adding all this mud to himself and, and all <laughs> yeah. these little leaves and stuff and it and it kind of shows how how Groot has style and, and he um you know he can um grow all these leaves then there's a squirrel bird that's like making fun of him the whole time that he eventually this rainbow squirrel bird that he eventually um when he can't grow <laughs> any more hair because the the mud is gone he just like takes the tail off the squirrel bird and like wraps it around himself like a boa again like a lot of these are kind of dark but i yeah. kind of like that because it's like an innocence with the darkness uh, and then he struts off like his fabulous little self afterward. And and I found this one very cute too. Like th- this was yeah. a lot of fun. Just kind of, again, expanding on the world of this character and like just what his daily routine is in terms of like ma- maintenance of his hair and physical nature, you know? So Dill, this is definitely my favorite of the bunch. Oh, okay. okay. Just because like I liked the different, like it was almost like a costume montage that was happening mm-hmm. with all the different styles of leaves. He was styling yeah, like on himself. Ken in Toy Story 3, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, yeah, oh my God. Yeah, I'm, I remember that. And I just like how, you know, they're not afraid to like, like Groot is like ruthless. Like when everyone, like when anyone starts to mess with Groot, I'm like, you're in a world of trouble now. Like, I don't think you get it. Like he doesn't hold back. Like just because he's small and cute, like doesn't mean, you know, he's not going to give it back to you so when at first when he had this the rainbow scarf on i was like did he kill that bird but no he just skinned it it was fine Which i think is honestly a little worse because that was <laughs> squirrel bird has to live without that tail or whatever or whatever it yeah was. um and then the last one we have is magnum opus which is i think my favorite uh it was okay um group basically you don't know what he's doing at first he's he's trimming hair off of rocket's tail he's stealing drax's soap he's stealing star lord's boot with the fire rockets on it he's stealing 
what it looked like a chip or something from Nebula or whatever. I don't I don't know if that was from Nebula or just to set off the bomb or whatever. But he's collecting all these little bits and pieces to then assemble a beautiful little picture and collage. And of course, we do get an appearance from Bradley Cooper as Rocket walking out there and yes, being like, do. Hey, "What are you doing?" And this is where you really see the fatherly dynamic. And I think that's something that. I, you never see in the movies, but it's very evident here of like the dad you know, pulling out his glasses. What is this? Oh, that's cute. But then realizing that he blew up the ship in, in the process of making it. But I love this. It was like it was an homage to the team and how Groot sees the team and that he is a team player because obviously when he's a teenager, some of that is lost because he's yeah or whatever. Um, but it it goes back to the nature of what older Groot was, the original Groot and Guardians, and like being one for the family. And I, I like that about this. And and how yeah. funny it was him trying to get all these things, him riding the soap like it was a surfboard, and like the subtle little like silhouettes of all the Guardians was a fun little little added kick to like remind us that it's the Guardians, even though they couldn't pay to have them all in it. So right, um, yeah, re really really cute. I, I thought this one was a nice way to finish the series as well. Like it was a good send off. Yeah, I agree, Dale. My favorite part was when Rocket pulled out those reading glasses. <laughs> that, so that's good. too good. That's too good. He's like, oh, let me, what are you handing me this for? Let, let's see. Oh, this is a really nice, cute picture of us. Why does it look like a bomb went off in here? Oh, because <laughs> a bomb went off in here? Got it. It's just like, you can't beat their, you can't beat their dynamic, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if I had to rank these, because <laughs> you know we, we might as well wrap it up now. Um, definitely sure. the, the picture magnum magnum opus was my number one. Then I'd probably go Groot's, Groot's pursuit just because I love the battle, the dance off, and I like the idea of it ending in that like morbid way that the other one couldn't. Uh, then Groot takes a bath, and then the little guy, and then Groot's first steps. Only because Groot's first steps, I feel like, was the least least bit happened. Um, but do you have a ranking for them, or do you just want to give your favorite and least favorite? I would say that Groot Takes a Bath is my favorite. Honestly, wait. It's Groot. Groot Takes a Bath is my favorite. Honestly, Groot's Pursuit is probably next. Nice. Then, then uh, Groot's First Steps. Oh, then nice. Magnum Opus. Then The Little Guy. Nice. So we were both a little let down by the little guy's uh, you know, ending, but it's it's okay. Um, <laughs> all, all, all very cute, though, and I do recommend yes. it. I think it's a good way to like just kind of like cleanse your palate, and if you want to, if you're on like a, a subway ride or, or going somewhere and, and you have like a few minutes to kill just to check your phone and watch something real quick, like this is a great way to pass the time. Um, and it's it's very funny. Like Kelsey said, she laughed out loud. I think I laughed out loud. Out loud um, twice i forget when but 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 i did i did i, I did laugh out loud and, that, and that's yeah. very telling for something that's only three minutes a piece but yeah um all right moving on now to the bigger topic of the day obviously i know the the series recap of i am group was not the big topic of the, of the day oddly enough but uh it is of course um she hulk she hulk episode one hell yeah so kelsey lead us into this uh, i'm very excited to talk about this because i'll admit i had my reservations going in only because you know as was a big topic of conversation amongst a lot of fans, the CGI has been a big topic of conversation in terms mm. of just uh, what we've heard about the actual ins and outs of the visual effects departments at Marvel and how they have been mistreated and all that stuff. So, so seeing the trailer and being like, mm, that design looks a little off. Um, I was a little hesitant, but I, and I still have some criticisms of it, obviously, but uh, I'm excited to talk about the stuff that we didn't see from the trailer, a.k.a. the story and the setting up of the series and the characters and the acting and all that stuff. So, Kelsey, lead us into this. So, we starting with episode one, titled, obviously it's the only episode out, A Normal Amount of Rage, in which we meet Jen Walters, an attorney who, after getting into a car accident with her cousin Bruce Banner, becomes a Hulk. So, Dill, I got to be honest with you, I, this is, I, I mean, this can't be true, but for some reason, after I watched this episode, this is the first time I immediately texted Dill and was like, I'm so excited to talk about this with you. Um, yeah. I don't know what that means compar comparatively to the rest of the series you watch. I think it's because I just know that Bruce Banner is your favorite and yeah. there's. Yeah. I don't know. There's and, a lot to discuss. Well, here. and and I know um, 
you know, we are both feminists here. There's a feminist channel, but it is a very feminist piece. It, yes. it, it deals a lot with those those criticisms and those messages without being too over the top with them, like actually having them there to like make a statement without like going overblown with it, but also making it present enough that you get it. Um, sure. And and I think that also I was watching. I was like, Kelsey's going to dig this um, just because <laughs> because of those things. Um, and not, not to say that I, I wouldn't I, not to say that I wouldn't dig those things. I, I did dig those things. And those are actually the strong. I don't know what's going on in my hair. I'm going to have to grab a hat. But um, but I, I, I think it's it's one of those series where, like, I think the messaging is so strong in what it's trying to convey um, in just this one episode, at least. I don't know about the rest, but I, I, I yeah. was like, wow, this is going to be speak to a lot of people the way Captain Marvel did, the way Miss Marvel did in that sense alone, uh, which I really, really appreciated. And, and that's why I was like, yeah, Kelsey's going to dig this. Um, but I'm interested to talk about all the ins and outs because I don't think it's a perfect show, obviously. Like, I think it's got its flaws. Sure. Um, and, and we'll just talk about the series as a whole and what this sets up and, and where this acts in the series because um, I I did hear that this was supposed to be a later episode. This was supposed to be after we had already established her as this attorney, then to go back to how it all started. And they thought it would be easier to start with the origin and then start the series essentially with episode two. And I think the good thing about that is that we can just get the origin out of the way. But the mm -hmm. bad part about that is that, of course, because this is an origin, you know, it's kind of a little familiar at times. And, you know, a pilot is supposed to set up the premise of the show. And this doesn't set up the premise of the show. This sets up what the character is because the premise of the show is this law stuff. And I feel like the actual introduction to the law stuff is coming in the next episode. So I almost wish they had released the first two as like one pilot to be like, this is her origin sure. story, how she became She-Hulk and how she became this attorney and like how she kind of got this started. Because the whole premise of the show is that she is an attorney for superheroes because there is, is real no such there's no real such thing but we don't find out any of that in this first episode we find it out from the trailers obviously and just from the synopsis of the show and, and what the comics are but it's like the actual idea of her being a superhero attorney none of that's in this first episode this first episode is just who she is as a character which i think is strong for character building but if you're presenting a series i don't know if it's the strongest pilot in terms of introducing what this concept of this whole show is so i'm a little mixed on that um, but I do like how now we just kind of have this origin story out of the way. We don't need to deal with her training anymore or her like kind of figuring out who, what her powers are. It's kind of like we got that over it with. Uh, and now we yeah. can dive into the actual crux, which is the law stuff, which we saw a little bit of, um, but not to the extent of what it's going to be for the rest of the series. But um, Right. So we get into our Marvel intro right off the bat and we cut to Jen in her office who's she's rehearsing um, her closing arguments on a big case that she's about, about to go into already. She's having to deal with um, just like this awful male presence in her life. His name is Dennis. Who's like, eh, I think this would be better if it came from me and it's already undermining her and, you know, doing all the things that, women have to put up with in their work life and such. Um, there are a few things around her that I noticed on the walls. I didn't know if they were necessarily Easter eggs per se, but I did write them down. So she is a graduate of UCLA. Nice. Um, she has a little plaque on her shelf that says, I am not arguing. I am merely explaining why I am right. Um, she has a book in that. the corner way back in the depths of her shelf that says badass woman on it. And I did take a mental, I did take a, not a mental note. I, I physically wrote it down. I took an actual note that <laughs> uh, during her uh, rehearsal, she's doing it for her friend, Nikki, who's a paralegal and her coworker, Dennis. And while she is doing it, he says, you should, he says more smiles. You should smile more. And Dill, if I had a dollar, if I got a dollar for every time I was in just at my silly little serving job in New York, how many of my male coworkers came up to me and said, you should smile more. I wouldn't have to work as a server in New York City. <laughs> I'd be able to pay my rent just fine. Uh, so yeah. I felt her pain in that moment. Yeah, we're already <laughs> getting shades, uh, shades of, of the feminist theme yeah. thematic uh, core of this thing right away. And I, and I like that. I think it's, it's strong. So as uh, Jen is leaving to, you know, go to uh, the court uh, courthouse, she quickly turns around and is like, Oh, just give me one second. And she's like, yeah, 
I she breaks the fourth wall. She starts talking to us directly as the audience and says, hey, I know you're you're, you know, in order for you to pay attention to my lawyer show, you're going to want to know the background of how I became a Hulk. So, you know, what? let's just get this out of the way now so that we can just have a lawyer Mm -hmm. show from here on out. So then we flash back to a road trip with Jen and Bruce. Bruce is in the midst of explaining um, a device that he had made for himself that helps him transform back and forth between being Professor Hulk and just his human form as Bruce. Which then explains the Shang-Chi post credit scene, how we were like, how is he not Professor Hulk anymore? And that answers your question. Exactly. And then we... uh, dive right into a theory that Jen Walters has about Captain America. And that is whether or not Captain America died a virgin. Mm -hmm. Which at this point in the timeline, we're, we're assumed that everyone thinks he's dead except for the people who know he's alive or he died and they just didn't tell us, which still just seems weird to Marvel to just not say that. So yeah, we know he's old man cap now, but the young cap is supposedly dead because he went back in time or whatever. But um, yeah. So as they're having this uh, fun little conversation, um, it's funny now because I feel like they've brought now two different things into, um, made them canon in such a way that like the fandom has just talked about like amongst ourselves, like yeah. the Ant-Man theory about going into Thanos' butt. They address that in uh, the ride that they made at um right. Uh, at the Avengers uh, it was the compound. Disney Cruise. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Disney Cruise. Yeah. And but, yeah. now they've written uh, this Captain America theory into... But we know that Peggy existed, so I don't... I I never assumed that he was in there. Well, quick quick <laughs> side note real quick before we get into the virginity thing. Did you, have you ever sure. seen The Boys? Are you watching The Boys? I am watching The Boys. How far do you I get? Haven't, um, I'm, I'm like on like the fourth episode, I think, of season three. Okay. Oh, okay. So you might have... Have you gotten to the... Th- the scene that is inspired by the ant-man theory um yes i yeah. think that was the first episode of, yeah, of season three yep of season yeah. three. um yep so just that i'll just put that out there <laughs> <laughs> if you if you watch the boys you know you know exactly if you don't watch the boys <laughs> don't um, worry about anyway, it <laughs> uh back to back to steve uh, so you you thought because peggy was always in the picture that he must have lost his virginity but then again we see so much of him and Peggy in First Avenger, but we also see when he gets frozen. So it's like, when did they have time? Um, and I guess that's what the question is. Sure, he, sure. He meets Cat. When did I'm trying to think of when he meets Peggy in regards to like how soon after he gets all the powers and stuff? Does he know Peggy before he even gets the powers? I don't yeah, know. he knows Peggy is little Steve because she's but there. Steve wouldn't have, wouldn't have. You know. No, little Steve was not. Little Steve was, he yeah. said he never had the right dance partner with. That's what I thought the whole innuendo was. Was that, oh, I've never found the right dance partner. But they weren't really talking about dancing, Bill. Right. But then when does he have time to dance during the movie is the question. I guess. With, with I Peggy, guess he, at least. I guess he doesn't. So maybe they just kiss. Because he might be one of those things then, then he goes back like, in time. See, they don't know that he goes back in time. Well, yeah, no, he's definitely, he's definitely had so much sex with Peggy back in time. But we're talking about the actual cap proper. And the thing is, like. And we do have the answer for us at the end of the post credits, which we'll save. Yeah. But like, I'm trying to think yes. of actual Peggy and why this theory makes sense. If you're not Bruce and you don't know actually for verbatim, um, sure. I, I think it's one of those things where when you actually have feelings for someone, you don't want to rush right into that right away. You kind of want to like take her on a date first and all that stuff, and like actually develop right. a connection and not just potentially ruining it with sex. Whereas like a one night stand is whatever sometimes, especially at the time um with a soldier like that so maybe he was thinking well i'm not just gonna like sleep with peggy because i actually care about her i want to like you know get to know her better and all that stuff sure so that's my thought is that he just didn't want to do that right away with peggy he wanted to wait first for that first date which he never got whereas other girls he was like yeah whatever fine which we'll address at the end who he actually ends up sleeping with which is quite crazy but uh, i wonder if he had any kids with peggy anyway so they're driving down the road back in time i assume maybe i don't know that'd be kind of fun Anyway, while that's, they're driving, that's down some the multiverse road, stuff. I, I don't think. Sorry, I cut you off again, but I, I think that's some multiverse stuff that they realize they put themselves in a little bit of a trap with, and they might have to explain later down the line. And they're just kind of like, uh, uh, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> we'll we'll see. I would love to see a little baby cap. Um, so they're driving down the road, and a spaceship comes out of nowhere, and uh, Jen and Bruce end up getting into a car accident. They're like flung off the road they're rolling down a hill into 
a forest and Jen is trying to save Bruce, get, pulls him out of the car. And while she's doing that, some blood from all of Bruce's cuts gets into Jen's cut. And that is how she gets the Hulk DNA mm. in her. She hulks out. She runs into the woods. She wakes up at a rest stop slash bar area. And she goes into the bathroom where she's trying to get herself cleaned up. A horde of women come in, all wearing very flashy outfits. They have makeup ready available. They're like, oh, girl, let us help you out. And she's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm really just trying to like get cleaned up. You don't really have to start putting on makeup on me. One of them pulls out an extra pair of shoes she has. She goes, oh, you need some shoes. You're in a public restroom here. Have some shoes. Yeah, They're, you know, spiff- extra pair spiffing of shoes. her up. You're yeah. Honestly, like I've been a woman in a in a public bathroom at like, you know, a bar and and such. And I would not be surprised if, you know, some girls, some of these girls came with an extra pair of shoes in their bag. These Um, I was just about to say uh, we can talk in a a bit about the actual uh, way she got her powers. But I think I think that was a really interesting way to do it. I I haven't read the comics, so I don't know if that's how it happens in the comics. But I think it was a good way to to make her She-Hulk without having to explain how she could be She-Hulk this whole time or, you know, like it was a very organic, natural way uh, yeah. it seems like to get her the powers without having to go overboard and trying to explain all this mythology. It was as simple as cross DNA contamination, which honestly, you know, it, it's very simple and, and it gets the job done because now she's She-Hulk and now that's easy peasy, you know, she's, she's She-Hulk. Yeah. I was wondering how and why she was, gonna be she hulk i'm glad they answered this right away because in my head when they made her and bruce cousins i was like oh so does it just run in like the banner dna but no it doesn't and i was like great this but now this i have a question now. which kind of goes yeah. back to the cap question sure can go bruce ahead. have children i think i think he can uh, can he though because if it's transferred through blood i mean that would also assume that because like the way STD spread, like I, my, my thought is that if it's in his blood, it's also elsewhere where I don't think he could impregnate someone without it being a baby Hulk. I mean, he could, but it would be a baby Hulk. I think you think, it, but I think it would be a baby baby. And then when the baby got mad, it would turn out, it would turn into a Hulk. Yeah. But I'm saying like the, the baby would have the Hulk DNA. If no, I think that, yeah. I think that, I think he's capable of having children, but I think that it they would, would turn, they would, be it, Hulk. It, okay. they, they would be half human, half Hulk. Yeah. yeah okay. That, that was my question. Like, like, does okay. that mean that he, so realistically he probably wouldn't want to have children by that means. Um, Cause I, I don't know, maybe he would want to have a, a little Hulk child. I don't know, but um, that Although, was just an interesting I mean, conversation. I mean, he, he could always adopt, but. You know, I'm thinking surrogate. back to the conversation he had with Natasha in Age of Ultron, where they're like, you know, they're trying to like have a relationship. And he's like, I don't think you get it. Like, I can't like give that to you. And she's like, well, I can't have kids either. So I'm yeah, like, my was thought he was just, that in the bedroom, just, his heart rate gets so high that he turns into the Hulk. And that's why he can't. Right. Isn't that- yeah. So I guess maybe he can't have kids because logistically he can't. Unless he he does it with another Hulk, but that would require him having to pass the blood on to someone like Natasha mm. and then have them Hulk out to them to have two Hulks. I don't know. I I'm think we're thinking too much right about now. this. This is a family friendly <laughs> channel. We need to move on. Um, so she gets all spiffied up in the bathroom. She asks if she can borrow one of their cell phones to call Bruce. And then while she's waiting outside the bar, she starts getting harassed by these by this group of guys. She hulks out yet again, you know, takes them all out, wakes up on uh, what looks like some sort of like resort. You hear seagulls in the background. You're immediately thinking, oh, it's an island. It's a beach. Where what's going on here? And then she looks over and there's a and there's a cute little outfit waiting for her to get changed into. And it is a Led Zeppelin T-shirt and a pair of shorts. And we know that one of the bit lovers of led zeppelin and you know 70s rock music is tony stark so maybe this is possibly a tony stark t-shirt left behind Interesting. yeah i didn't even think of that I, I was thinking more um uh led zeppelin did immigrant song which is in thor ragnarok which is what bruce banner but then i guess they didn't hear that song 
Because I was like, that's the song that plays throughout Thor Ragnarok. But then I'm like, Bruce didn't hear it, though. We hey, it. Dill, but I love that you even knew that. Maybe that was okay? like an homage, you know? Like, I I'm know. in, yeah, it could be. It could be a double homage to Tony and Thor Ragnarok. Who knows? Love the thought process there, Dill. Thank so you. now we know that we are in Bruce's lab that Tony built for him. Um, this is where he spent his time during the blip you know trying to merge the hulk and banner identities together and this is basically where he's gonna you know train and uh help jen walters you know come to terms with being a hulk and how she can you know regulate her powers mm -hmm. when she transforms how she gets back you know keeping her anger in check all that jazz and then we learn that the spaceship that you know intercepted them on the highway was a sakarian class 8 spacecraft and that, and Bruce says they were just trying to deliver me a message. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. So, what does Sakar want with Bruce Banner? Oh boy, I wonder. I love yeah. that little Easter egg moment. Mm -hmm. Another Thor Ragnarok connection. Love it. There it is. Okay, so then, so then Bruce takes us. So he says that he's been studying uh, Jen's blood for for a minute here, and he says that her blood is is made up of some sort of uh, healing properties that were actually able when he mixed them with his blood, I guess he was able to heal his arm. Cause we know that when we started this episode, his arm was still in the sling from, uh, doing the yeah. snap and Avengers Endgame, And now he's completely healed and he's back to be uh professor Hulk. Um, and she, he's trying to explain to her that, you know, things aren't, she's not gonna there's no cure for being a hulk you 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 have to just regulate it and you, mm. you kind of just have to work with it and things are just not going to go back to the way that they were before and jen is desperately just wanting to get back to her life as a lawyer she doesn't want to be a superhero she doesn't want to be a hulk she just yeah. wants to you know for things to go back to normal and he's like listen lucky for you i've like documented my, documented my 15 years of being a hulk i know you know my, all my mistakes and everything are written down in this binder and i'm going to help you through all of it so the first their goal is to control uh when she changes so mm -hmm. he puts her in a box um which has a wall of just blades swords you know coming at her and that slowly but surely it's going to come at her and if she doesn't change into a hulk it's gonna kill her so he says that anger and fear are the common uh, are the most common emotions that trigger tr the transformation into a hulk which we know and jen says well that is just the baseline of existence for every woman ever every woman at it at her core is angry and afraid and yeah. Yeah, Another I agree great with that. Thematic for sure. thread, yeah. Exactly. So then she says we do have a little Pixar drop um real quick while she's in the box. She's like, Well, if you just want to trigger, why don't you just play the scene for with Bing Bong sacrificing himself <sighs> off the wagon from inside out? I missed, that. I missed that for some reason. How did you Pixar, Mr. Pixar over here? How did I you was miss taking the Bing notes Bong? and I was probably writing. All right, I get you, I get you. So lo and behold, she does transform. She does not die from the blades because that would put a very quick end to our series here. And, you know, she she hulks out. She starts, she rips off the door. She throws yeah. it. And Bruce is very much like, you know, he's under the impression that he's dealing with a Hulk, you know, this kind of mindless, uh, low IQ being yeah. that just will destroy anything in its path. And he's, you know, trying to shh, calm her down. He's like, whoa, girl. And Jen's like, why are you talking to me like I'm a stray horse? Yeah. And and in this moment, we realized, which I didn't realize before, really, I didn't put two and two together, that Jen doesn't have an alter ego. When she's a Hulk, she's still Jen at her core, and she's still conscious and very aware of, of, of what she's doing. The first two times she hulked out, you know, she did black out, and she didn't remember what she did. But, you know, this third time around in the show, she very quickly, you know, gets that a uh, handle on on her situation um so this is when i as a, a a rabid uh marvel consumer can see why some people would already take issue with the series right off the bat with there being some inconsistencies of okay so bruce has a 15 year struggle trying to figure out you know what his situation is but Jen Walters immediately right off the bat is able to have a better control over mm -hmm. herself. 
I also think a lot of it stems from where two things. One, the amount of gamma. We don't know how much she actually got in her bloodstream to where, like, I really don't know how much blood was transferred. And I don't think that I am. I want to believe that, like, yeah, if he had put three bags of blood in her, she'd maybe hulk out a lot more. B, where they were in their lives at the time when this did go down, you know, Bruce was at a very different place than Jen was. So I don't know if that's that has something to do with it as well. Just like maybe just the own anxieties of present day life and how that triggers it. I don't know because Jen seems like she's well put together. She's got her job. She's confident. Mm-hmm. She knows how to stick up for herself. She knows how to handle these terrible men around her. Um, and Bruce maybe was more of a lost soul when it happened to him. Those were my two ideas of mm. why she doesn't. And also just cause it's a series and realistically we only have so much time to tell the story. Why waste so much time of her just being like, Rrr! and right. the other thing being the fact that visual effects and the fact that they had to really scale down the visuals for this series um, because they were, this was the last in an order of so many series. And this was kind of like the bottom of the barrel, the last thing that got attention. And that's why they even said, that's why they're going to have more gen than they are. She Hulk because they just don't have the budget and means to make she Hulk like have her in a lot of the series mm. um, because it's just costly and they're not enough. There's not enough time for all the workers to do what they need to do efficiently. And that's been, you know, a big topic of conversation with Miss Marvel and Thor love and thunder and all these movies and, and TV shows recently. Um, and, and I think that kind of hurts it in the fact that we're not going to see a ton of she Hulk, but I like Jen uh, on her own a lot. And um, I, I, I think, you know, making her seem a little bit more human saves a lot of the budget costs as well so you know thinking of it behind the scenes and on story-wise i think those are some reasons why we may be seeing yeah. this uh merging of jen and she hulk and and kind of them being one being right away um and and anyone who's criticizing that as a legitimate way to criticize the series and say if you're criticizing the visual effects bill fine but if you're criticizing it saying well she's a woman how come she got to do it right away and and Bruce had to take all these years. Get get the fuck out. Like, come on. That's a stupid way to argue. Like that's, that should not be your biggest complaint of the series. I really don't think, you know, you know, Dill, I think that we get our answer for all of this somewhere down the line in this, what I like to call the Hulk training montage, but I Mm. did just want to throw that criticism out there. That's not necessarily something that I am, you know, know. taking issue with. I just feel like I can hear the haters in the background, you know, being bothered by this. Sometimes, you know, you go on here and you're like, oh, we're going to talk about this episode. But then because of social media, you see the reception and you have to almost kind of defend it as well, at least certain aspects. Like there are some things I won't defend about the series that I have issues with, but none of it have to stem with the idea that she's a woman and things are different for her because of that. Like, I don't think that should ever be a criticism. If anything, I think that's something that the creators are trying to say with the material, you know, trying to make some sort of parallel, make some point with it. Yeah. But, um, yeah. The only thing that I do have issue with in this series is that I especially notice that Bruce's Hulk is so detailed and so much, you know, better. And Jen Walters doesn't look like um, the same amount of time went into crafting her Hulk. I think the visuals, As Bruce. the visuals and aesthetics are the one weak link of the show. I think, yeah, like, I, and and the thing is, this is one of the only episodes with Mark Ruffalo, so they had the time to be like, all right, we're gonna like get you nail nail it, and then yeah. the rest of the show, it's like, you know, we don't have to deal with that a lot, and and that's again, like, y'all pay your visual effects department and and give them a logistic, a, a legitimate, realistic goal. Because mm-hmm. the thing is, you know, and, and it's something we've heard a lot with Marvel is that they keep creating these deadlines and then they say, oh, but we want like three or four other options just in case we go with different directions. And I think there's something cool about having options to go with your stories and franchises. But at the same time, you got to understand these are people and these are workers and they can only do so much. So saying let's do four different takes, four different things, and then we'll pick which one we want to go with depending on who we have in the next project and all this stuff and, and all that stuff. And Hey, we need to add a post credit scene here to connect this series with the series. And like that kind of stuff, it becomes taxing after a while. And I wish they kind of just prioritize what needs to be prioritized um, because this is a sitcom at its nature. It's a comedy. It's it's, it doesn't have to be the most like cinematic in its visuals. Like they don't need to spend too much time you know, getting all these elaborate sets and stuff. They can focus on the visual effects of She-Hulk and then maybe have a more scaled back 
maybe one or two set show or something like that. I, I don't really know. Um, I'm just trying to think of ways they could have figured out the budget to make it look a little bit better. But yeah, I think the visual effects are the one thing that stands out the most to me. Um, even though yeah. the performance is good enough that it transcends it, thankfully. Um, but in the wrong performer's hands, who knows? Yeah. Um, we do have a Natasha name drop. Um, you know, Jen is asking Bruce, like, oh, how did you, how do you come out of like being the Hulk? And he's like, well, I would just wake up as Bruce or uh, Natasha would sing me a lullaby. And I, it's in that moment, you know, it's a very like, ah, we left. Love Natasha, R.E.P. Natasha, Miss Natasha, obviously. Yeah, from but from it, what I've heard about the uh, the series, I heard it's going to be very comedy forward. I think this one episode is going to be the most dramatic because it does yeah. have to kind of be the origin. And those moments where, where Bruce is talking about Natasha and Tony in yes. this episode, like that yeah. really gets to me. And like, that's why I'm like, the whole time I was like, eh, but like, I wish they committed a little bit more to the comedy, but uh, if they're going to be a full on sitcom, but I was like, you know what? We have eight, epi eight other episodes and this is very much the origin story. Like I'm fine with this being more sentimental, more personal and, and giving Bruce a lot to do because like you said, he is my favorite character. And I yeah. do love seeing those moments of him talking about his peers and, and his long lost peers, which, which sucks. Um, but yeah. So Jill, speaking of Mark Ruffalo, I, it was during this like whole like montage where they're doing like the meditating, like um, the meditation stuff together. They're throwing boulders together. Mm -hmm. You know, they're doing all this like fun stuff together. And, and maybe it's just because we just did a Mark Ruffalo uh, movie club, but he's just so darn good. I'm, I was just loving, I was loving he his is. performance in this and it's, it, and it's him, but it's like him, like all CGI'd up as the Hulk. And it's still like, mm -hmm. still so fun to watch and still so endearing. Mm -hmm. And him and, and Tatiana are just, I think have the best like chemistry back and forth wittiness together. Yeah. Um, because training montages, again, like we've seen so many that we need them to be different. Falcon and the winter soldier gave us a very different one. This one gave us a very different one. That's what I like. It yeah. doesn't feel stereotypical. It feels natural. And because it's a familial bond of like, this is my older cousin. Because the thing is like, siblings are so close. You know, relationships are very close. But like cousins, we don't see a lot of in mm -hmm. this franchise or any real big franchise. So it's cool to see that dynamic where like, yeah, you're family, but there's still like, you know, there's still something, uh, you know, between you two that, you know, is just not as close as a sibling or, or anything else like that. But. Yeah, totally. I had to write down this line because I just thought it was so funny where she's he's like walking her through the the meditation that they're going to do together. And she's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, holding your farts. Like, isn't this about just like getting your butt tight as hell? And he's like, gross, Jen, I'm your cousin. Just like do the yeah. breathing exercise. It's, it's, like, that's, it's so good. Yeah, that's natural. I actually really think the comedy is done well here. And I don't know yes. how... Cause, cause like I said before, I've heard the show at its core is very funny, like, like sitcom funny to where like you could even have a laugh track. And I didn't feel it with this episode, but like, I hope they really do touch on the comedy well, because I'm fine with comedy in the MCU if it decides to be a comedy. Like that's the mm -hmm. thing with Guardians is it works so well because they are comedies where something like Thor, Love and Thunder, I was like, well, it's also trying to be a drama about cancer and God, God Gore the God but Butcher at the same time. Like sure. how are they balancing all these things? So I, I'm glad that this show is taking a little bit of a lighter approach and I love, and we didn't even talk about this yet, but the, the breaking of the fourth wall as well as, mm -hmm. as an homage to the comics. Cause that was her thing. She was the one who broke the fourth wall. It was her and Deadpool. Um, and she beat him to it in this franchise, but um, like that's her thing. And I like that too. I, I almost wish there was a little bit more of that, but um, yeah, I like the comedy in this. I think it's natural. It doesn't feel over the top, but it is funny. It's smart. And it's cool to just see like more of a laid back kind of, not low stakes, but not as well, not as low stakes as some of the other shows. Cause I don't think this is as high stakes, but it, but it, mm -hmm. it works. It works. It's, it's the right stakes for the show and the story. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and it's, so we we're going through this montage and Jen is essentially just killing it at everything. There's not one test that Bruce has put her through that she hasn't either um, met him at his match or has just completely exceeded his expectations. So, you know, she's getting pretty tired of, um, Oh, he does say that, you know, one of the perks of being a Hulk is that they can drink a lot and that it's all buzz and no bar. So they have this moment together where they're drinking. He's talking about how Bruce and 
Uh, Tony and him uh, built the bar that they're at. You can see there's a little carving of Bruce Banner and and Tony Stark's initials into Stark the bar. Stark. Yeah, I know. And, uh, you know, Jen wakes up the next day and she's like, I didn't even, you didn't warn me that I would have to, you know, deal with a Hulk size hangover. And I deal with human size hangovers and I cannot imagine what a Hulk size hangover is. Case in point, Dill is dealing with one right now. Not a Hulk um, size one, but yeah, maybe like you know. a, maybe like a good, uh, Bucky Barnes size, uh, <laughs> like, like a nice old robotic metal arm to the arm. face, but, but wow. no, no Hulk hands. <laughs> Gotcha. So she's just ready to get back to her life, you know, and, and he's like, no, there's still so much you have to learn, like, you know, you have to really have a like a handle on your anger on your emotions. And this is the moment where I'm like, ah, everything's kind of clicking and making sense here, because she goes off on this whole tangent that I can very much relate to, where she says, you know what, I maybe I'm just better at all of this maybe i'm just better at being hulk because i have to keep my anger in check constantly and more often than you do as a man because every time i get cat calls or every time a, a, a man mansplains something to me i have to keep my emotions in check at the fear of either being called emotional or difficult or quite literally being murdered mm. and i was like yeah yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there's no lie. There's no lie there, really. Yeah, yeah um, that's a good point. And, and earlier, yeah, we were talking like all the different reasons. Yeah, the gamma could be something, but like this is probably the crux of why she's able to do it so successfully. And, you know, yes. um, yeah, I, I really like that idea. And, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, where like she was in a, already a place where she had her emotions in check, like you said, when she got this, dis not disease, well, I guess you could call it a disease, the Hulkness of it all. Whereas yeah. Bruce probably wasn't. Uh, and I've always thought that Hulk has been a great parallel to like anxiety and, and just stress and all that stuff in general. And what yeah. we do when we bottle up our fear versus when we unleash it and, and all that stuff. I think it's been a great commentary, even in Infinity War, when it, it becomes almost like a, a f fear and, you know, not wanting the Hulk to come out because you're afraid of something, almost like erectile dysfunction that Mark Ruffalo is going through in that in that movie. Whereas, yeah, like, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Important. But having it be a woman's lens just heightens that commentary even more. Like, not just now are you dealing with the anxieties and the stresses and the fears of just life, but now having to look at it from a women's perspective is just so so smart i think i think this is just such a smart character to introduce to the mcu to take the things we've already known about the hulk and bruce banner and all that stuff but now add it to that female perspective and i i think that's the best part of the series is that thematic thread of, of the feminist uh core that it has and you know i've seen some responses to it being like oh get that out of my mcu first of all fuck you um and, be, and, and other people that. being like wow i never realized just how badly women were treated until i watched she hulk and i'm like okay like i get what you're trying to say i get the sentiment behind it but also like it took you yeah. till 2022 from the one episode of a marvel show to realize like that's also Truly. a little tone deaf so like yes, yeah if, if this helps puts things into different perspectives or better perspectives sure but like also like this shouldn't be your excuse to be like oh, i'm gonna start treating women well now it's like you should have already been um, yeah but if this helps you that way and you change because of it, great. Uh, but, you know, one person who's very popular for for talking about Marvel stuff and, and TikToks and even in our movie theaters sometimes uh, was, yeah, saying stuff about uh, how how much he didn't realize it, that he didn't realize women were treated this badly and all this stuff. And it took She-Hulk opening his eyes. And I'm like, in saying that, you're, you're admitting a lot of stuff that in itself doesn't look good either. So I know you're trying to sound, you know, progressive and, and good. Yeah. But also like, like it shouldn't have to take the series to show you that when also captain marvel and miss marvel did very similar things so i'm like hey, did you not yes. watch those like this is just a continuation of that but it's like not it's not like this is the first thing ever preaching women's rights like i'm sorry yeah and also um, you should just listen to women in your real life who yeah, not tell you CGI green like ones. what <laughs> um i'm Anyways. not gonna name names not gonna name names i think we all know who i'm talking about but yeah i'm not gonna name names interesting i'll text you i'll text you all righty oh boy i can't even tell if i'm looking forward to finding out who this text is about so and now we have a whole hulk on hulk brawl because you know bruce is trying to convince jen that her training is very much not over but jen is just ready to get back to her real life you know she's she doesn't want you know bruce is trying to explain to her like listen you're a superhero now like you are one of the few people that can help protect this earth 
And that's, that's your, that's your duty now. And she's like, well, I, I have a whole degree of, you know, that taught me how to help people just in a different way. It's the way I know how it's Mm -hmm. being a lawyer. And uh, so they have this whole like Hulk on Hulk fight. They end up breaking the bar. They rekindle their friendship by fixing the bar together. Um, And, you know, Bruce kind of comes to terms with the fact that, you know, Jen's going to go back to her life now. And we have our second uh, breaking, excuse me, breaking the fourth wall moment where she, he's like, you know, if you want to go back to your life, that's fine with me. And she quickly turns to the camera and says, he doesn't mean that. And then it's almost this moment of like a wall break within a wall break, very Deadpool-esque, uh, where Bruce kind of catches her breaking the fourth wall, but then, you know, doesn't. It's They just, you know, go on with their lives. It very much reminds me of like Fleabag. I don't know if you've ever watched that yes, show. Though, but she, yes, she breaks yes. the fourth wall. And Love then there's like there's only one character in the whole series that almost catches her doing it and it's very introspective and it's like it's like 16 walls as uh uh wade wilson would say um so now we're back in the courthouse uh jen is about to uh give her closing marks to the jury when uh jamila jamil uh shows up um as the antagonist, I don't know much about her yet. I kind of yeah. like discovering it as the show goes on. I don't do too much uh, back yeah, looking into yeah. the background as this happens. Um, but she shows up and Jen hulks out, uh, defeats her in one punch and says, I'm ready to give my closing remarks now. And that is the end of our episode. Yeah, this was the one moment where I was like, hmm, okay. So this was not supposed to be the premiere because we now get a villain that we know nothing about doing something that we have no idea what the motive is and just like busting through. And, and I get like, maybe they reshaped it or reworked it to, to, to make it fit within the premiere or whatever. But I just think like, I wish they had just not even had this be the villain who busts through, like just have it be some other thing because when you're, because this is the series villain we're talking about and the way this episode, like I said, was originally supposed to come out, this was not supposed to be the premiere. It was supposed to be kind of like after we had established the crux of the show, now going back to see how she got her powers. And I wonder if that's because that that's why this moment feels so random. Like, I feel like if this is happening, we should know who this character is and know her motives. Mm. And I didn't feel that. But maybe that's just because I haven't seen the rest. And maybe it'll work better when I rewatch this having seen the rest. But I almost wish you know, this had come out when it was supposed to later in the series. So then we actually know why this is big, that this person's busting through the, the doors or whatever. But I, I don't know. It's a very small nitpick, but um, very interesting though, because we don't get the premise of what the show is yet. And I mm. think that's just so fascinating is that we're going to get the introduction of what the plot of this series is in the next episode. So, um, but well, for an origin story, I think this was pretty solid. I mean, it set up who the character was. And I, I liked it. I liked the journey she went on. I like those parallels. And I hope they keep up with the feminist parallels as well. I hope this wasn't just like a, well, we need to like explain, we're going to use this feminist theme at, themes and stuff to like emphasize the point of her becoming She-Hulk. Like I hope it keeps through to the end because I really yeah. think that's, that's the strongest part. Well, Dill, I think that it 100% will because I was looking at the IMDb really quick while you were talking and because I just wanted to confirm that you know, this is why it's so important that like women's stories ha- are directed by women and that mm-hmm. there's women in the writer's room when this for is sure. happening, because that's why all of these moments, you know, especially for me, at least are so relatable and so accurate because there's women at the helm of this series and you can totally tell. And since it is going to be that, you know, for the next uh, nine episodes, um, it's I think that the feminist I don't think the feminist um theories are going away anytime soon and i think that it's a hundred percent so important that they stick around because you know as as disconcerting as it is that some of these people are just grappling with the fact that women are treated vastly differently in this life than men are through she hulk i think it's important that you know they really drive this point home so that more people get on Mm -hmm. get on board i never thought that i would be um putting my faith in humanity in the hands of a marvel series but alas yeah. i guess i do <laughs> and, and last i'll say about the criticisms also being like wow i love that women are directing in the mcu now um captain marvel had two directors one of them was a woman um and it was a pair that had directed before so it's not like it was at odds like it was a woman's vision like 
mm-hmm. you know, Anna Bowden. Um, Miss Marvel, directed by women. Uh, Hawkeye had some episodes directed by women. Um, and then, oh yeah. Falcon um, and the Winter Soldier was directed by a woman. Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And oh yeah, Eternals, which everyone bashed. Uh, directed by a woman who I Black think Widow. Really, uh, really did a good job with. Yeah, Black Widow. Uh, so yeah, women have been directing the MCU. And while some of the movies themselves are not necessarily the top tier, I think the issues have do not stem at all from the actual feminist uh, themes. I think actually that's the strongest part of a lot of these things. Like I think the character work in Black Widow is the strongest stuff with her and Yelena. I think it's the visuals that kind of let me down and, and other things mm. about the actual structure of the story. But I think the actual themes are the best part of it. Uh, just like kind of what I feel about this. I think the themes are the best part of it. I hope the comedy gets a little bit more straightforward, like just like committing to the sitcomness of it all in the next episode. I hope it goes even further. Uh, but, and I don't love the visual effects, but I think the themes in She-Hulk are already so strong. And Tatiana Maslany is so good. Like she's yeah. so good. Uh, did you watch Orphan Black? I didn't. Okay. She is so good in that, but it's also very different because like here we're getting full more comedy from her, uh, which I really like, but she can do so much and she is so good. And I'm very excited. I think that's the one thing that phase four, while it's been so up and down has done really well is it's casting, you know, getting, yeah. you know, Kate Bishop, uh, sorry, <laughs> Haley Steinfeld and, uh, you know, Florence Pugh and all those Eternals. Uh, and, and of course, um, Simu Liu and now Tatiana Maslany, like this is the next phase of the Avengers. Uh, and I'm, I'm very excited for it. Wyatt Russell. Yeah. Um, so, so many good casting choices recently that I'm just such a big fan of. I don't think there's been a bad casting choice recently that I can think of. Uh, Iman Vellani was great too. Like it, it's so good. Uh, Oscar mm-hmm. Isaac. I mean, like the, the, these cast casting directors are doing a great job. Probably Phase Four is than, stacked yeah. with some great actors. Yes. Now let's get like you know the technical department a little bit more uh, pay and a lot less overworking, and mm-hmm. I think we'll be back to smooth sailing. But yeah. Um, so, Dill, we have to you know talk about the big reveal in our post credit scene. <sighs> course um so (laughs) we're back at the bar at bruce's bar at his uh little hideaway on the island and uh um what's your name jen i was almost gonna call her tatiana um jen is crying about how upset she is that captain america died a virgin that he didn't get to experience sex because oh my god did you see that ass and bruce finally reveals to her that he did not die a virgin he lost his virginity in 1943 to a girl on the USO tour. And that is when Jen reveals that she's been faking being drunk just so Bruce would uh, can yeah. uh, finally reveal to her um, his sexual escapades. And she, yeah. the, the scene ends with her shouting, Captain America, fuck! And it cuts yeah. out. So. so a lot of adult themes in this show right off the bat. I don't know how much digging you've done on this have you no i okay. have not okay um I, so yeah um digging into a, what specifically into who this could be because we do see one scene in first avenger when he's on that tour where this blonde girl oh the girl him. the girl he's talking about yes the girl and then he like kind of does a little smile and it's a quick little thing now that act when she's when she goes up to him I know exactly what you're talking yes. about. So I that know exactly blonde what you're actress, that blonde actress. Okay, you know where I'm yes, going. Yes, with yes, yes. Yep, yep, yep. So yep. this actress also plays Peter Quill's mother in Guardians. Mm-hmm. So obviously, Peter Quill's mother was not old enough to be alive during Captain America: The First Avenger, but the theory is that because it's the same actress, maybe this woman that Cap slept with is the mother of Peter Quill's mother, making her Peter Quill's grandmother which then opens up the possibility that maybe (laughs) maybe captain america is peter quill's Quill's grandfather grandfather. (laughs) and here's the thing james gunn jokingly when they said like oh you cast the same woman from who made a cameo in first avenger she's the one playing uh what's her name margaret uh meredith meredith Meredith. thank you Thank you. I would have lost that trivia match. Luckily, that question was already asked. But um, <laughs> yeah, like James Gunn jokingly said in a tweet when someone asked like, oh, it's the same actress. What does this mean? He, he jokingly said, oh, yeah, that's Peter Quill's grandmother. So 
it could be. Now, he could have slept with someone else. He might not have slept with this woman. Yeah. But the yeah, woman yeah, that yeah. comes up to him that he's very physically attracted to, played by the same actress who plays Peter Quill's mother, Meredith, is probably the person he slept with. And that would make wow. it a possibility. Now, this could be a Mamma Mia thing. She might have slept with many different people. And we know that Peter Quill's dad is a planet, but his grandfather, yeah. we don't know. And we never actually met the grandmother or the grandfather, but it's highly um, speculated that Steve Rogers is one of the Mamma Mia uh, culprits uh, uh, that could be the grandfather of uh, Peter Quill. Peter Quill. Wow. Steve Rogers, yeah. Peter Quill. I love so, this theory, Dill. What do you the think? Old- do, you, do you believe it? <laughs> I, I believe it because that's honestly the first woman that came to mind when I was like, oh, well, who was it then? And I uh, and that was the people m- watching know who I'm talking about. This is the girl. She also plays uh, yes. Peter Quill's mother in uh, Guardians. Yeah, because the they have this there, like cute little step. like yeah. double take moment where mm-hmm. he sees her and is like, oh, so what a beautiful gal. And yeah. so. It was either her or it was um, the only other person that came to mind was the only other person that Steve Rogers kisses besides Peggy, which was um, the girl that we just watched in Rush. What was her name? Oh, What's Natalie Dormer's name? character. Yeah. Natalie Dormer's character. That was Could the only awesome. other person. Which would make yeah. him a house Tyrell. Never mind. Sorry, I'm getting into Game of Thrones now. Wow. <laughs> this opens so many doors. Um so wow. interesting yeah. so, how they tied so this in. Who let us know in the comments below? Is Peter Quill Captain America's grandson? And if so, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, or what or does he, it mean? Or was it Natalie Dormer? Or was it just someone else? Maybe it was Bucky and he just lied. Um, maybe he said it was some girl on the tour. You know, that would be kind of juicy, like a Brokeback Mountain story. We can make so many spin-offs of this. I'm sure um, there's like a horde of fans that are like Steve and Bucky were more than friends. I'm sure there's a campaign for that already. Hey, and and if they're if they can make a compelling arc out of it, and that's why he he feels so alone in his present day, and why he can't really find romantic connection with anyone, you know. Yeah, but if he, if Bucky was his one true love, why go back in time to be with Peggy? Maybe maybe Bucky wasn't his one true love, but maybe Steve was Bucky's. Ooh. Anyway, um, uh, we're getting on a tangents right now, but like, yeah, that could be a deep movie. That could be a deep, deep movie, if you know what that I mean. That makes me so uh, sad for Bucky now. <laughs> More right? sad than I already was. That makes Falcon and the Winter Soldier very, very sad. Um, but yeah, like, wow, all the doors this opens. And we we found out from Kevin Feige not too long ago that there's going to be a post-credits after every episode. So I'm wondering if we're going to get, like, little reveals and, like, dirt on each superhero as it goes along. Like, nice. maybe we'll get something on Natasha next. Maybe we'll get something on Gamora after that. Like, who knows? Mm. Um or maybe we're just, that was like this post credit scene and we're just going to kind of enjoy it and, and love it for what it is. But um, any other thoughts on the Cap thing? Uh, no, not specifically about the Cap thing, but I will say that I'm having a great time with this series so far. I think mm-hmm. Tat- Tatiana Moslani is great. Um, I love Mark Ruffalo. Um, yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, I, I don't know how much more, more we're going to see of, of Mark just because, you know... Um, he was uh, in, the, in the credits. It said guest starring Mark Ruffalo. So I think um, I spoiled it for myself, and I know how many episodes he's in now. But I won't I, spoil I, it for you. Okay. I, I won't say anything. Um, but we do know from the trailers, we're getting Wong, we're getting Emil Blonsky, aka the Abomination, and we're getting Daredevil. So that's coming, um, and it'll only be a matter of time before that does come. Uh, until no, but- then. Uh, we're going to be here talking about She-Hulk, I believe, next week. Uh, the thing with our schedules is that we have to figure it out. If we can get two trivia matches in by next week, uh, we will. If not, we'll save that for Labor Day the 5th. Um, so next week, we'll either have She-Hulk episode 2 or we will have trivia. And in that case, we'll have She-Hulk episodes 2 and 3 the next week. Uh, either way, we're going to double up on these weeks. Uh, it's just a matter of which one. Uh, i got to reach out to the We do have our, our headliner being a number one contender contender match so not the winner does not play kelsey but the winner will have the shot to beat Kel, to shot to play to play beat. Win, to beat i'm sorry beat to they're play already kelsey. Sorry. beating me no 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 no, no, no. Sorry, sorry i know sorry. who you now i know no, whose I, team you're on no i'm trying to say they would have to beat someone else to get to you and my words okay. are getting discombobulated so to gotcha. play kelsey 
Malcolm and JD will play each other. Whoever beats the other will play Noah. Whoever beats the other there will play Kelsey. So this is a number one contender to the number one contender. That is going to be our headliner. We don't know what our undercard is quite yet, but we are going to get Malcolm versus JD. Uh, That's all I can tease right now. That might be next week. That might be two weeks from now. It depends on our crazy schedules. But thank you, Kelsey, as always, for doing this with uh, an illness and being down the shore. Um, Sorry, I spoiled your whereabouts, but when this airs, you will not be there anymore, I I bet. So, um, and you you know, no one knows where down the shore that is because the shore is ginormous. Um, We're the only record. the only people who say down the shore anyway is people from New Jersey. Right. So yeah, the people only people from, from New Jersey who watch this are like, are what are they saying? So, yeah. Um, uh, so, Kels, where can they find me... you elsewhere? Not not location based, but on the internet. On the internet, you can find me Kelsey A Kilpatrick on Instagram. You could follow me on TikTok. I'm at Cause Thirteen there, K O Z Thirteen, or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel at Cause Productions. That's right. You can find me at Dylan underscore Randazzo Twitter and or Letterbox. Um, you can find Dylan Randazzo four one seven at TikTok and Dill Pickle Movie Network here. If you're watching, if you're listening, head to the Dill Pickle Movie Network. Subscribe, all that jazz. Like it up and share your theories as to who. Uh, spent that lovely night with Chris Evans. Sorry, Steve Rogers. <laughs> Don't we, bring we know, Chris into this. I was gonna say we we know some of that tea, but that's another time. Um, but yeah, we're not a celebrity gossip podcast. We're not. We're not yet. Um, <laughs> thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time. <laughs>